So here is our totally awesome video about oxidation numbers, which, by the way, is a big fancy term for simply charge. So first of all, we have this thing, I've told you about it before, a little bit called the hill of oxidation numbers, and it's something that I made up that you can use whenever you're dealing with ionic bonding only. Do not try to use this with covalent bonding. But the hill of oxidation numbers looks like this. You put the group numbers on the bottom, and this only works for um, the S and P block elements. So you've got group 1, group 2, group 13, 14, coming down the hill, 15, 16, and group 17. And then the oxidation number, the charges that these elements are going to make when they're in an ionic compound, remember ionic bonds only, for group 1 is going to be a plus 1, group 2 going up the hill is a plus 2, group 13 is a plus 3. Group 14 is at the top of the hill and it can be, it's usually a plus 4, occasionally it can be a negative 4, and you do have a couple other exceptions in this group 2 that can actually be a plus 2, um, but we'll talk about those exceptions later. So group 14, just remember they're kind of weird. But now going back down the hill, instead of positive we're going to be negative, but the number values are going to stay the same. So group 15 is a negative 3, group 16 is a negative 2, and group 17 is a negative 1. And the reason that these elements form these charges is because of their electron configuration and what they need to do with their electrons, either gaining or losing electrons, to look like a noble gas. But remember, only use that with ionic compounds. So an oxidation number, the purpose of it is to show how the electrons are distributed around an element when it's in a compound. If an element is not in a compound, then it's going to have an oxidation number of zero because there is not any kind of an unequal distribution of electrons. So pure elements have an oxidation number of zero. And in a compound, if you have two elements bonding, the more electronegative, EN stands for electronegative, the more electronegative element is going to have the negative oxidation number. And so by default, the less electronegative guy is going to get the positive oxidation number. And we'll talk specific numbers in just a second. So there's a couple of rules that you can stick with when it comes to assigning an oxidation number. First of all, fluorine, when it's in a compound, will always, always, you don't see always very often in this class, but always, if fluorine is in a compound, it will have an oxidation number of negative one, and that's caused by the fact that fluorine will gain one electron when bonding to look like neon. Oxygen is usually going to have an oxidation number of negative two. And for the most part, in, in this level of class, it is always going to be a negative two. Whenever you see that a compound has the name something peroxide, like hydrogen peroxide, well then in that one case, oxygen will have an oxidation number of negative one. And on the rare occasion when oxygen is bonded to halogens, in a binary molecular compound, that's the only time that oxygen gets to be a positive two. And that looks kind of like, you know, if oxygen was bonded to a couple of fluorines, well, each of the fluorines is going to be a negative one. You've got two of them, so that means oxygen would have to be a plus two. So this is an example of that right there. But like I said, most of the time, oxygen is going to be a negative two. Hydrogen can either be a positive one or a negative one, and it depends on what it's bonded to. Hydrogen's going to be a positive one when it's bonded to elements that have a higher electronegativity. Um, this elements that have a higher electronegativity than hydrogen, those are usually nonmetals. And it will be a negative one when bonded to elements of a lower electronegativity, and this is usually metals. So like when carbon is bonded to oxygen, like water, well, the oxygen is going to be a negative two and the hydrogen is going to be a positive one because when hydrogen is bonded to a nonmetal, it's going to be a negative one. 
and let's say um, hydrogen is bonded to potassium and you have potassium hydride. Well in this case uh, potassium is going to be the positive guy and hydrogen is going to be the negative guy. So it all depends on what hydrogen is bonded to as to what kind of an oxidation number it's going to have. And y'all please don't get tripped up by the term oxidation number. It really is just a fancy term for charge. Uh, group 1 metals that's your alkali metals. They will always have a positive one charge when in a compound. And the group two metals, the alkaline earth metals, will always be a positive two when in a compound. Remember, oxidation numbers, it's all about compound. So, in a compound, in a regular all chemical compound, all of the oxidation numbers of all of the atoms have to add up to zero. If you're dealing with a polyatomic ion, then the sum of all those oxidation numbers is going to equal the charge on the polyatomic ion. So if, you know, let's go back to water. Water, that's an oxygen, I swear. Water doesn't have a charge. It's a neutral compound. So that means the oxidation numbers of all of the hydrogens have to add up to the oxidation numbers I'm sorry, I said that wrong. The oxidation numbers of all the hydrogens plus all the, the oxidation numbers of the oxygens have to add up to zero. Whereas if we have a polyatomic ion, say like nitrate, which has a negative one charge, well then the oxidation number of the nitrogen plus the oxidation numbers of the oxygens are going to add up to negative one. And we're gonna do some examples of that in a sec. So like I said before, again, we're stating oxidation numbers of pure elements, elements that are all by themselves. You only have one kind of atom present. Like when we were dealing with the pure copper, um, that is an oxidation number of zero. Or if you were dealing with the oxygen that you breathe, this is pure oxygen. Yes, there's a two there, but there's still only one kind of atom, so the oxidation number here is going to be zero. So we do have, of course, some exceptions. For every rule, there's going to be an exception. Um, the nonmetals, when they're in a covalent compound, they can have lots of different oxidation numbers and can actually range from as low as negative four all the way up to positive seven. So when you see this and you're actually working out examples and you end up with sulfur being a plus five, don't go, uh, wait a minute, no, sulfur's in group 16, it has to be negative two. When sulfur is in an ionic compound, yes, it needs to be a negative two. But if sulfur is in a covalent compound, it can be a plus five and that's totally acceptable. Transition metals, I kind of mentioned these guys before. Uh, these are the D block metals. They can range, their oxidation numbers can range from a plus one to a plus seven, depending on whether they only lose their S valence electrons or if they lose their S and maybe a couple of their Ds. And one more time, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the hill of oxidation numbers only applies to ionic compounds. Do not use the hill of oxidation numbers on covalent compounds. It doesn't work. Are we stuck? Oh, too far. Sorry. You probably want this practice slide. Give me a sec. Wow, we're going crazy. Okay. Um, so we're just going to work out a couple of practice questions here. What are the oxidation numbers for each of these elements in the compound? So starting with H2SO4, this is starts with an H, so that means it's an acid. This is sulfuric acid. And following our rules, we know that when hydrogen is bonded to nonmetals, it's going to have a positive one charge. And we know that for our sake, oxygen for the most part is going to be a negative charge. Two. Well, the only element that we don't know is this sulfur right here. And we do know that this whole compound has to add up to zero. So we can set up kind of a very simple algebraic equation to figure out what sulfur is. So we're going to take two times the charge on the hydrogen because we have two hydrogens plus whatever the sulfur is, we don't know, so we're going to call him X, plus 4 
times our charge on the oxygen because we have four oxygens. And that whole thing has to add up to zero. So we solve all this out. You end up with 2 plus x. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. So plus negative 8 equals 0. Well, these two guys come together. And we get x plus 2 plus negative 8 is negative 6 equals 0. Therefore, x has to equal positive 6. So in this case, sulfur has a positive 6 charge. Now here we have O2. There's only one kind of atom here which makes this pure oxygen. Therefore, the charge on this oxygen is just simply going to be 0 because it is a pure element. Now we have potassium permanganate, MnO4 is the polyatomic ion permanganate, and assigning oxidation numbers to each of these. Potassium is an alkali metal, it's in group one, so it's going to have a charge of plus one. Oxygen, usually, in our cases, almost always, has a charge of negative two. And manganese, this is a D block metal or a transition metal, so its charge can vary. So this is the guy that we need to solve for. So we have one potassium, so we're going to go positive one, plus manganese is what we don't know, so that's going to be our X, plus four times our negative two on our oxygens. And this whole thing is a neutral compound, so it's going to be equal to zero. So rearrange this, or just kind of put stuff together. You get one plus X plus negative eight, that's just four times negative two, equals zero. And so X plus one plus negative eight is negative seven equals zero. Therefore, X equals positive seven. And I know it might seem a little redundant to put that positive sign there, but it does need to be there. So make sure that you're putting both the sign and the numerical value. Now, looking at OF2, oxygen difluoride, we have a covalent compound. And we know that our rules are that fluorine, when in a compound, is always a negative one. Well, oxygen, we usually think is negative two. However, the rules are whenever oxygen is bonded to fluorine, it's not going to be a negative two. It's going to be a positive two. And if you're going, hey, wait a minute, why? Well, remember that for every negative, we've got to have a positive to balance that out. So if we make oxygen our x this time, we can say x plus two times negative one is equal to, this whole compound is neutral, so is equal to zero. So you get x plus negative two equals zero. Therefore, x has to be positive two. So in this case, oxygen is a positive two. Now we've got a big one here, magnesium phosphate. PO4 is the phosphate polyatomic ion. Really, really important that you guys know your polyatomic ions that are on the list that I gave y'all or just pretty much any list that you find on the internet. You need to know polyatomic ions. So looking at each of these, we got three elements we need to deal with here. We know that magnesium is an alkaline earth metal. It's in group two, so it's going to have a charge of positive two. Uh, phosphorus, we actually, we don't know what he's going to be. Oxygen, it's going to be our negative two. Oxygen's back to normal here. How do you know if oxygen is back to normal uh, being a negative two? Well, just look at what it's bonded to. When oxygen's bonded to fluorine, that's when it's going to do something weird. Otherwise, just go with the negative two. So to figure out phosphorus, we got a lot of math we got to do here. So first, I'm going to take three times my positive two on the magnesium plus... P is going to be my X. Phosphorus is my X. But notice I've got a couple of phosphoruses. Phosphori, phosphoruses. Uh, I actually have two of them because this two distributes to everything inside here. So I'm going to take two times my X plus two times four is eight times the charge on the oxygen, which is negative two. This whole thing is a neutral compound, so all of this is going to add up to zero. So just kind of simplifying this a little bit, three times positive two is six plus two X 
plus 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. This whole thing equals 0. So I get 2x plus 6 plus a negative 16 is a negative 10 equals 0. And I'm going to move up over here so because I'm kind of running out of room down here. So 2x is equal to 10. Therefore, x is equal to positive 5. So phosphorus over here is going to be plus 5. And in the next video that you guys uh, can watch, I work out lots and lots of practice problems. So watch as many of those as y'all feel you need.